Good morning, everybody here present and uh, those who participate on uh, in live stream sessions. Um, I open this academic session during which Ms. Rad Tagavi, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, will defend her academic thesis in public. Uh, the, uh, the thesis is written in English language under the title Machine, Machine Learning for Imaging in Colorectal Liver Metastasis. Before we start our questioning and opposition and the candidate her defense, the C will give a small presentation about the, the research she performed and a summary of her most important findings and conclusions. I ask you to start your presentation now and wish you the coming hour lots of success. Thank you, Rector. Uh, dear Rector, dear member of the Corona, dear uh, my supervisors, dear family, friends, colleagues, thank you for joining me here today uh, at the Maastricht. And also thank you for joining online. In the next 15 minutes, I will present my thesis with the title of Machine Learning for Imaging in Colorectal Liver Metastasis. Uh, liver is the most common site of the metastasis for colorectal cancer, and approximately more than 20% of the patient, they have a synchronous metastasis. And it means that at the time of the diagnosis of primary tumor, liver detected with metastasis. However, around 15% around of the patient, they have a metachronous liver metastasis. And it means that at the time of the diagnosis of the primary tumor, liver does not have any metastasis, but later on in the follow-up, uh, liver developed metastasis. For patients with colorectal cancer, imaging will be performed uh, regularly for detection of the liver metastasis. And when the liver metastasis is diagnosed by the radiologist, multidisciplinary team uh, will determine the best treatment options uh, based on a uh, number of the lesion, location of the lesion, and the size of the lesion. And for resectable colorectal liver metastasis, surgery would be an option, and for non-resectable one, radiotherapy, thermal ablation, or chemotherapy are the alternatives. Um, if we can early identify patients at a risk of developing colorectal liver metastasis, what can we offer? A different treatment strategy with more intensive follow-up can be offered, or in the case of uh, using thermal ablation as a treatment, uh, optimally guided uh, ablation panel planning with combination of intensive uh, follow-up can be suggested, and all of these together can potentially improve the overall survival for uh, patients. However, Visual CT assessment may fail to assess macrostructural changes in the liver, which can be early identicators of risk of developing a liver metastasis. So the assumption here is that the medical uh, imaging have uh, much more information that cannot be uh, appreciated by eye. Quantitative medical imaging has been studying and investigated a lot in, this, in recent years, and it's, me, and it's kind of the data-driven approach. It means that we are from medical imaging, we drive to quantitative uh, medical uh, features. And uh, to do so, we have to follow some steps. The first step is we are, we are talking about medical imaging. So the first step is to start with the, uh, getting the image uh, uh, for, uh, from the patient. And it depends on a uh, cancer type, follow-up, and the treatment we can offer. The patient can have an MRI, CT, or a PET scan. And in the next step, we need to identify and delineate the region of the interest. And the region of the interest can be liver, lesion in the liver, or primary tumor. And this step can be done by, uh, by an expert manually or using the automatic segmentation algorithm to uh, delineate this uh, region of the interest. In the next step, a large quantitative features uh, are extracted from this region of the interest, and they can be re representative of the shape, uh, intensity, or texture of uh, this region of the interest. The next step, if you consider each blue boxes as a, a, a imaging feature, we need to select the stable, informative, and predictive one. So we need the feature selection part. And in the next step, the, uh, the machine learning algorithm will employ it to develop a signature uh, that can be used uh, for clinical decision making. The whole workflow is called radiomics, and the, and the features we are talking about, we are extracting from this region of the interest, is called uh, radiomics feature. 
So we have this information hidden from the images. What can we do with it? Uh, our thesis is uh, divided with uh, two clinical questions based on a colorectal liver metastasis. And the first question is that the, the assumption in the first clinical question is that the new liver metastasis, uh, they develop from small cancer cells in the liver. That, and on that time, it was not visible on the radiological images. Uh, so uh, we select a region of the interest, liver, uh, and the aim is if the radiomix features from the liver can say something about prediction of the liver metastasis. In the, ne in the next clinical question is that if the uh, lesion in the liver uh, can identify, uh, can say something about how well it uh, responds to the treatment. So the first question is that the radiomix features from pre-treatment and also the uh, uh, investigating the radiomix features of after treatment. And the aim for uh, this thesis is to develop and validate machine learning model based on CT imaging data to predict outcome for colorectal liver metastasis. So to answer our questions in all chapters, we built three prediction uh, models. If we use the, the radiomics features, which I explained about it, we call it radiomics model. And if we use clinical variables, such as age, uh, gender, treatment, or location of lesion, we call it clinical models. And if we combine those information together and build the predictive model we called a uh, combined model. In chapter three, uh, our aim was to investigate whether the radiomics features of healthy liver parenchyma can predict the liver metastasis. The data were collected from the three different hospital, and uh, the region of the interest here is the liver, and we, uh, we divided our cohort into two groups. Those groups, uh, the time is the time of the diagnosis of the primary tu tumor, which is the colorectal cancer. And in group A, they don't have a liver metastasis on that time, and they don't develop liver metastasis later. In group B, they don't have a liver metastasis on that time, but they will develop liver metastasis at later stage. So if we look at it by eyes, by visual uh, checking, we cannot see any difference between these two cohorts. But we build a tribute predictive model, and the radiomix model performed the best with the AUC of 0.86. AUC is a performance metric uh, for prediction models. It is between zero and one. And if it's closer to one, it means that uh, the model does the better job to distinguish between two uh, groups. And if it's 0.5, it's the flipping coin, is the random uh, uh, prediction. So after testing the first hypothesis and first question, the next one was to investigate the radiomics features of the lesion. And we are checking the pretreatment and post-treatment. And the treatment here is the patient who have a thermal ablation treatment. Uh, thermal ablation, it was one of the uh, treatment for colorectal liver metastasis for non-resectable one. So it used the extreme heat temperature to destroy or to ablate the liver metastasis. Um, but however, in some cases, uh, a regrowth will happen within the ablation zone, within the, the lesion we destroyed it, or in the edge of the ablation zone. And we call it local tumor progression. So in chapter five, we investigate the radiomix features of the liver metastasis before thermal ablation, and we build the three predictive models that we can see uh, if we can predict the risk of uh, LTP. Uh, in this case, in this study, combined model performed the best with the AUC of 0. Uh, 79, and then the both radiomics features and clinical value uh, were selected as a, uh, the most predictive uh, features. In chapter six, we investigate on the after ablation treatment. So we have the ablation zone after ablation, and as I mentioned before, the LTP can happen also around the ablation zone. So we add 10 millimeter margin around the ablation, and we extract the radiomix features both from ablation zone and 10 millimeter margin, and build the three predictive models. In this study, combined model performed the best, and the selected the the the. In the feature selection part and prediction part, the radiomics features from the ablation zone, from the margin, and clinical variable uh, has the most predictive uh, performance. In chapter seven, uh, we try to combine both information we have. So we have a pre-CT scan, we have post-CT scan. We want to see, uh, can we use both of them and try to predict the local tumor uh, progression. In this study, we, look, we move forward to the deep learning algorithm. So we move forward from extracting uh, the handcraft features, which was one of the parts of the radiomics, to uh, automatically extraction of the features. Uh, with deep learning. Deep learning model uh, they, um, they learns, uh, deep learning model learns the 
uh, different features and also representation of the imaging data uh, without explicitly need of feature engineering part in the feature extraction part. And we can uh, we can fed the images directly to the network. So it has a, um, uh, it usually they, uh, they have the input layer, they have several hidden layers that is for the feature extraction part, and they have uh, output layers uh, that, that can produce the, um, the prediction. And the prediction here is the prediction of LTP. Uh, mm, so after, the after the, we build this model, the interpretation of the output of the, this model shows that in the area, if you, if you see the circle, uh, the red circle in the right part, the area around the ablation zone was uh, highlighted as the, the area for prediction of the LTP with the patient they had the LTP. So it, it can be really useful if we can interpret the result, if we can see the result that the model make the prediction based on this region and it can be really, really useful in the uh, follow up after thermal ablation. Um, I would like to conclude in the last slide. Uh, first, um, the, uh, cl the potential clinical uh, value of the radiomics approach uh, that can assess the, the metastatic disease in uh, colorectal liver metastases, and they can be promising uh, tools for the clinical decision making. And we saw that the combination of both clinical and radiomics model can be helpful uh, for prediction of the developing of liver metastases. However, in future study, we should uh, take the account of the generalizability of this model it to, uh, on an external cohort, on an external hospital data set that we can see, we can reproduce uh, uh, this model uh, with the same result on a different cohort. And also the interpretability of, the, of methods should apply in a prediction model uh, to see where model uh, based on what make the decision or makes the prediction. And I would like to thank you for your attention and give a walk back to the Rector. Thank you. <coughs> I think a very clear presentation. Uh, I could not follow everything, but that is not my task here. Thank you for this. And you left us a few more minutes than we pre yeah, thought before, and that gives us uh, some additional time for a good academic discussion. And that starts now. The first one who wants to discuss with you is Professor Andre Decker. He's um, a professor in clinical data science at this university. He shared the manuscript assessment committee and I can already say that all members of the assessment committee of your manuscript are present today so I will not announce everybody up separately. Uh, That's a good thing to have the whole committee here. That does not happen always. So the floor is to Professor Andre Decker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector, um, and dear candidates, uh, thank you for, for writing a lovely thesis and for having me assess it, and let me also congratulate you, um, your promotion team on that, and I'm sure all the people that have helped you with that. It was a pleasure to read, and I would like to uh, also to spare you a bit of um, um, effort. would ask one of your paranyms to um, read to us proposition number four. In a clinical multicenter setup, variations Im in image acquisition, processing param parameters, and segmentation should be considered in the radiomics analysis pipeline. Thank you very much. Um, so my first question on this proposition is, is a simple one, right? I think this is related to chapter number three, um, which I think was the only multicentric study you did, if I'm correct, sorry. Can you explain why you do not more of them, why they're so difficult? In chapter four, you mean the when the model we built in chapter three, why it doesn't work in chapter four? I'm saying that in chapter three you present a multicentric study, correct? Where you use data of multiple cohorts, different cohorts. But yeah. 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 yeah highly esteemed opponent. Yes. In chapter three, you present a multicentric study. Um, and I think it is the only multicentric study in your thesis. 
So can you explain why it is so difficult to do these multicentric studies in this field? My opponent, thank you for your kind words and the, the question. Um, I think the agreement between the hospital and um, it, it was very difficult, honestly, uh, to, to make the agreement, also the data privacy in between. It was very difficult because we want to have a data in our hospital. So, I mean, in the radiomix study, we use the data set images from the different hospital, and that makes it, uh, I, I think, difficult to collect. So, I think if we could use some, uh, now with the, with these days, we can say that the federal learning, learning, that we are not sharing directly the images, that would be easier uh, for the following up uh, for multicenter study. Okay. I, I, I definitely agree with you. Um, now, in this proposition, you talk about uh, a number of things that you need to do to make data more interoperable, right, for radiomics. And one of them is, for instance, segmentation. Um, but in, as you just said, in chapter three, you have all the data in your hands. So I guess you could, you could standardize the segmentation in those scans, or is that not possible? Possible because the, the, um, the data that we had from the different hospital, they already had segmentation, and we segment only for our cohort. So that's why the, the, the segmentation was different. However, we correct for the differentiated between the segmentation uh, radio mix features across the segmentation of the different hospitals. Okay. So in that study, segmentation was not a real issue then. Um, but of course, as you as you rightly say, these scanners are made with different you know manufacturers, different scanning protocols. Um, and um, you're right to say that 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 is something that should be considered. But I would like to ask you how to do that. Right? What is the best approach you feel to correct um, uh, these different scans? Uh, that remove the human bias, I think. So if you are using the the automatic uh, segmentation algorithm that we have, a, we have the nice one. So I think we passed from the, the, uh, the, the time that we used random forest for, for liver segmentation to now really having the nice unit, for example, model for segmentation. So if we have the uh, one uh, nice algorithm to do that, that uh, I think is ideal for the, uh, for the segmentation standardization. But that just corrects segmentation, right? What about the other things? different you know different scanner manufacturers for different slice thicknesses or different um kv so um the, uh, i mean the standardization i think it can be in two level the image level and the feature level so we are talking about i think the image level that we uh, we we can correct it for for the in a, in a different level so the image level it first start with the um, image accusation part that we have a different center and also within the center we have a different scanner so that causes a differentiation between the, the scan we have so either we can we can have the standard standardized parameter for image accusation part that all the images that can cure in a in a one set of the parameter, and also after that, or or in a uh, post processing of the raw sensor data. So before reconstruction, I'm talking about CT, for example. Before the recon uh, reconstruction, we can do some post processing to remove the this variation as well. Um, and also, uh, we can have some automatic algorithm in between, uh, for example, that we can correct for this variation, like for example. Uh, yeah. 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 So, for example, uh, um, I've I've seen some research done in a the transfer style uh, uh, algorithm or like the GAN algorithm, for example, the generative adversarial network. Then automatically we can uh, we for example in, in a transfer style uh, we can have the uh, the image reference image reference image in one hospital and another image that we can transfer the image to the style of the reference one, and it can be very really useful, for example, for the if you are talking about the radiomics, for example, we, I build a model based on what the data set I have, but is the new data set with the new, with the new uh, scans coming. So with this transfer uh, style, I think we can um, homogenize the data set we have. Right, good. No, well, I totally agree with you that, that I think standardization of images would be the best in acquisition, but that will never happen, right? That's, that's a lost cause, I think. And so I, I'm, I'm fascinated by your proposal to use GANs for that. Um, 
my question there is the following. Suppose you, you, you have a radiomics analysis and you, you produce, let's say, a thousand features. And some of them are texture features and some of them are shape features and some of them are intensity-based features, right? What tells me that a GAN will standardize all thousand of them? Or might we need a standardization per radiomics feature, you feel? No, I mean, the GAN was in an image level one. So we, we standardize images with the GAN. But we have, for the feature level one, we have the different uh, standardization for features. So for example, we can use the statistical normalization to normalize images, to normalize features, or um, also using another algorithm that we can have uh, more reproducible um, across, the, across the different images. Well, but um, we know, for instance, that that texture-based images are quite um, dependent on on noise and on um, slice thickness, for instance, right? Um, are you saying that you can correct these on a feature-by-feature -feature basis, or should we make a new image with a GAN in which the noise, for instance, is reduced? What is your what would you propose? I would go for the first one, to standardize images first, to remove the noise. Given time, I think I have to give the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you for, uh, for answering my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Decker. The opposition will now be continued by Professor Nissen. <laughs> He's Professor of Biomedical Imaging, Image Analysis at the Rasmus Medical Center, Rotterdam. And he's also coming to us by screen. Professor Nissen. Thank you, Mr. Director. So, dear Ms. Candidate, uh, uh, first I would like to compliment you with your nice work and also your uh, uh, promoting team. Uh, congratulations for the, with the great work. So, I, I had a question uh, first related to Chapter 3, in which you compare uh, the clinical model to the radiomics model. And, and maybe I could have found it, but I didn't find it upon my reading. In the clinical model, did you use the image information in some sense or not at all? Uh, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your uh, kind word and the question. Um, no, in clinical model, we didn't use any imaging information. Uh, but in combined model, yes, it was a combination of the clinical and radiomics model, uh, radiomics features. Okay. And, and, and so I was just wondering, what is clinical practice now? Would clinical practice be just using the image and the subjective evaluation of the image uh, combined with some other features? Because uh, now you're comparing radiomics, which is you're adding both the image and the radiomics analysis versus the clinical model. Or, or is it clinical routine not to use the qualitative information from the image data? Uh, I think the... I think the, um, it depends because uh, if you are if, because some clinical variables they are not uh, it, it is really related to the uh, tumoral and it's really based on our output detection but some of them not but and also the but but we, when when you are talking about the quantitative features they are really we are really extracting the features from the tumor or from the region of the interest which is correlated to our clinical outcome we want to have. So that's why I think when in chapter three, the, the radiomics model performed, performed better than the, the, the routine clinical variable. And also I think that the clinical variable, um, in some point, uh, if we are only look at one clinical variable, maybe it's highly correlated to the outcome. But again, yeah, we are combining all tumoral and not tumoral related to the, our clinical question and make it all multivariable analysis altogether to make the prediction out of it, maybe that's, uh, that's not a good, a, good, a good way to go for clinical models. Yeah. Okay, now for, for me it's clear that, the, that the, the image data plus the radiomics analysis provides some additional information. I was just wondering whether it's just the addition of the imaging modality or was really the imaging modality plus the radiomics. I think you, you're making a case that it's probably the latter, but, but I'm not sure whether we can conclude it from, from the data. I have a, a follow-up question, and that's a little bit on the on the feature selection uh, process you utilize. Eh? You, so you, you start with a, a, a very large number of features, and then based on looking 
whether those speeches are different between institutes or they're co co correlated. You go from about 1,800 features to 300 features to 100 features. Um, I was wondering, are you concerned that maybe even though you have good performance, you're throwing away information in that step? Are you are you optimally using the image data and is this a crucial step? Or could you potentially also leave out information that could have a, a predictive value? Uh, I totally agree with you. That's why in the in the in the first question, I, I also uh, now kind of fan of the image standardization rather than the feature standardization. In because when we have the, a lots of data set and it's the it's the arbitrary choice that we set a threshold, for example, 0 0.8, and removed all those features. And when we are removing the, those features that they are significantly different across the hospitals, uh, at somehow we are making the decision that we are also uh, giving out some information as well. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me uh, like it, it's quite an efficient way to do feature reduction. Eh? It's easier to, but, but it's also in, indeed using a criterion that is not necessarily linked to what you would like to, uh, to optimize. Uh, do you know about any research and investigation into whether this, uh, whether this feature reduction steps based on these criteria are indeed uh, you, uh, a very pragmatic and useful way to go, or are they being challenged? What, what do you think about that? Um, I think uh, in 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 the in the those years that we were we were investigating on this study, most of the most of the study they re used also first the uns unsupervised feature selection to remove the, the the differentiation between the hospitals and if we are variation if the in the segmentation remove the segmentation part and then we 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 go for the feature selection and prediction in parallel together to make the prediction model. Um, but however, we can. We can standardize image uh, before that, for example, um, but by taking into account this variation as well, instead of removing those. So, like the the combat so harmonization. So that would be. <laughs> I no worries. <laughs> so, like the combat, for example, harmonization that uh, we can harmonize the the radiomics features, but uh, they are they are kind of the methods that they shifting the data distribution, uh, but saving also the correlation, the biological correlation between the features as well. So, I think it would be a better option than just removing the features. Okay, clear, clear. Okay, then I would like to move to, to your chapter two. You do a very uh, extensive uh, uh, literature study into different methods, and, 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 and you really note that it's actually also quite difficult to compare these challenges and there's some lack of, of validation. Now, I'm, 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 I'm wondering, what do you think is really needed in terms of validation in order for the clinical end user to know what solution to go for. If, if there's multiple solutions on the market, how can we ensure a proper validation such that yeah, you can make, make a responsible choice what uh, method to use in, in, in clinical practice? That's a very good question because uh, when we are talking about the validation, we want to check that all those radiomics features we built in the study is reproducible. So if because at the end we want we want to have these radiomics features as a kind of biomarker. So if we want to put it into clinical practice, we need to make sure that they are reproducible. So and for that we need to have the external validation to validate those results and also well documented. And how would you go about doing that? Is this a prospective evaluation? Is it a retrospective validation and a challenge with a common data set so that you compare methods? What 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 do you think is the most important proof point for an algorithm to be trusted? Um, I would go first for the retrospective one. So, for example, I build a model in my in in, in my uh, set of a small cohort or a small cohort. Then I need to validate it in a, a another a, another cohort. So it is also retrospective analysis. And if the result is good, then we can go, move forward to prospectively one. And the prospective one, it should I think the first step it should be in an observatory. So we we just the patient come, we treat it as a regular. We 
we do the images as a regular, and we, we have a prediction model, and then, then also the radiologist or multidisciplinary team decision, and we observe those two outcomes together in the follow-up. And then in the next step, it would, it would let us to use it in a clinic. Okay, yes, thank you. I would like to thank you for your answers and uh, give the word back to the rector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nissen. That means that we are on schedule again, on time schedule. You have spent the two minutes you gave <laughs> us as a bonus, and everybody can stick to the original time schedule again. The next opponent is Professor Vivian uh, Chan Heinen. She's uh, inter uh, Professor of Internal Medicine and Special Medical Oncology at the Master University Medical Center. Today, she's also acting as our secretary of the board of this committee. Professor Chan. Thank you, Mr. Prorector, uh, Ms. Candidate, my congratulations also for the supervising team. Uh, I enjoyed reading the, the papers, although in some points it was quite difficult for me as a clinician, a medical oncologist. And when I'm reading such papers, I'm always thinking what would help the patients, what is the benefit of the patients from this research. So I focus on chapter three. And uh, I have some questions uh, here on. Um, first of all, the patient selection. Um, when I read it, I noticed the number of patients is quite small, 91 patients. And you also split it up into a, a training cohort and a validation cohort. So the numbers became even smaller. Why did you choose to have such a small number in a disease which is quite regular in the community? Highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your uh, kind word and question. Um, uh, yeah, it, uh, the, the, patient, the, 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 the colorectal liver metastasis is famous, but it was really difficult to collect the data at the, uh, in the multidisciplinary part and also at the NKI, because uh, the most the patient, they come at the later stage and they already have a treatment in other hospital as well, and then they come to following up for the another treatment or the following up of the, uh, the disease. So based on the, this study, we check, we check the liver, liver from the beginning at the time of the diagnosis before any treatment. That, that, was, the, that was really challenging to find a nice data set that they had the imaging at that time, and it was a portal venous phase, and it was not any artifact in the image that we could use it. Okay, so if you had the opportunity to, uh, when you would have in the hospital uh, and you had a large number of, hus uh, of patients, you would have chosen to have more patients? Of course, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So it's, it's always better to have more yeah. patients, to have data. Yeah. We are happy. Okay. <laughs> and um, uh, you were interested in liver metastasis, so you divided patients who did have or did not have uh, liver metastasis within 24 months. I wondered why didn't you choose to uh, categorize patients with liver metastasis within 24 months and then those who did not, not have metastasis within, for instance, the first five years? So this, when you would have split them up more uh, widely, because I could imagine that some patients might have a metastasis after 25 months yeah. and then they are in a control group. It feels a little bit odd. The yeah, I totally agree with you. And then we would end up with even less data set. So yeah, I mean, I totally agree. After the two years, they still might have a, a metastasis after that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, patients with rectal cancer normally have primar primarily uh, lung metastasis, whereas those with colon cancer have more liver metastasis. Did you look at that and whether that would have confounded the results? Uh, in clinical variable, we made the choice that we, we, in, in we, we, which colorectal uh, cancer it is. Is the rectum, colon left, and colon right, and added into the clinical uh, model as well. Okay. So it, 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 take it, it took care, care of it. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, then I want to discuss with you the, the aim. When I look at page 63, you mentioned that um, in the third par uh, paragraph, uh, page 63, you say in the middle somewhere, these features can be used to develop predictive, diagnostic, or prognostic models. So which one <laughs> did you develop in this chapter? In page 62 and paragraph 63. Oh, 63. Uh, so the introduction and then the third paragraph. Then in the middle of that third paragraph, you see a sentence which starts with 16, reference 16. Then these features can be used to develop predictive, diagnostic, or prognostic models. And I was wondering, what model did you build in this chapter? Um, 
it is predictive because we want to have a prediction. Um, and what was it, the, the diagnostic one? And I think the prognostic, it with, um, it with when it already happened, we call it prognostic. So uh, I think, yeah, it's, it, the, the definition of the prediction and prognostic at this stage could be the same. Yeah, because I yeah. think somewhere you wrote down that um, there were minor structural changes. And I thought, well, perhaps these other places where uh, this metastasis are developing, but not yet visible. Yeah. Is, is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I would say then that it is a diagnostic one, just earlier diagnosed Which diagnosis of microscopic disease. Yeah, you but were not visible at the time of the yeah. diagnosis. Yeah. Okay, you agree. Yeah, uh, fine. <laughs> Um, did you look uh, on the patients who were, had an abnormal CT scan? I don't know whether you looked in this way. Patient A, she had an abnormal CT scan with this um, uh, radiomics, and whether she was the one who developed distant metastasis in the liver at that particular place. So can you uh, correlate it exactly from uh, abnormality to location of metastasis, or is that not possible? That's a very good point. We didn't uh, for, uh, we didn't check for that, but it's definitely um, it's good to check. So you mean that we have the liver, we have the li clean liver, apparently uh -huh. clean liver, and in yeah. the follow up we have the metastasis yeah. over there, and yeah. we check it. Um, I'm not sure because in between the patient could have a treatment as well and also have a chemotherapy treatment and also can have a um, hepatic resection. So I'm not sure how, I mean, it depends on the treatment of the patient and, and uh, because it, it would yeah. be, for example, like the next 24 months, it would yes. happen a lot in the liver. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure that we can really compare these two liver together. Because I think that would be definitive proof if you have a patient who did not receive chemotherapy, not a local therapy, but you just are worried about the radiomics and to follow this patient, she has developed a, he or she has developed a distant metastasis in the liver, you can combine the two together and that might make your point, your, your case stronger. stronger, I think. Um, Oh, and my time is up, I think. Or no, 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 this just is the technique. It is, uh, oh, yeah, oh, I think that's time is <laughs> Just one more question then. Yeah, sure. uh, short one. For, um, the conclusion on, in the abstract of chapter three, I wasn't sure whether that is truly based on your results or is that more an implication? Uh, is it based on your results? Be, be, you say it uh, can provide valuable biomarkers. But in my view, biomarkers are more pathological or, or uh, yeah. No, for the, for the, um, because the whole point of the radiomics at the end, we would like to have the imaging biomarker. So, and this chapter was the multicenter study and it, we, we take to, to care of all variation as possible as we could. So that's why in the conclusion, we said that it might provide the valuable biomarker. Okay, yeah, very fine. Thank you, I give the word back to the pro rector. Thank you, Professor John. Then the session will be continued by Dr. Lahe. Dr. Lahe is a radiologist at the Netherlands Cancer Institute, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek Hospital, Amsterdam. Dr. Lahe. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Well, dear uh, Miss uh, Candidate, I really enjoyed uh, reading your work and I really want to applaud your multidisciplinary team and supervising team in this also. And um, I really, really that does happen often. I really liked your whole book, reading it. But I'm a little bit of an MRI geek, as you may know. know. <laughs> and I couldn't help wondering, when I was reading your, your chapters, like, oh, what if they used C uh, 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 MRI in uh, instead of CT? Uh, what is your opinion about that? Should you, do you think your uh, data would be improved by using MRI imaging or is it complementary or what do you think? Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind word. And that's the, that's the very good question uh, because the whole book is based on a CT imaging actually. Um, as I know that the, uh, the CT imaging is a kind of the working horse in the liver imaging and for, for the colorectal liver metastasis. And the, the MRI is a kind of the, the problem solving. So if they, if, they, if they have a more complex situation or complex patient, they will go for MRI. And however, because in uh, MRI we have a different sequences, so we would have a different information and it would have a better res resolution for the, for the liver metastasis. So at some point, yes, I would agree 
if we had the MRI images, especially uh, for chapter four, when we could not identify between the patient who will develop liver metastasis or not with it in the case of thermal ablation, what was an, uh, as, uh, was, uh, was one of our suggestions that it would be better to use MRI for the to check to to double check that uh, can we see the, um, can we see the liver metastasis or uh, or it was there but we couldn't see in the CT images. And if I have like two USB sticks here, one with the, all the MRI images of all those patients, and one USB stick with the genetic profile of all those patients you looked at, and you could only choose one USB stick just to improve your model, what would you choose? Uh, what do you mean to prove the model? So if we already built a model based on the city images, and then yeah, we so want you to prove which it? Which kind of data would you add to your model? to further improve your accuracy in predicting the presence of liver metastasis? If you want to improve it, uh, because the, the features we have from the city and we build the model, that definitely would be different that we have from the MRI. So um, it's not the same that we, we build a model based on this data set with the base on the city and then we're going to apply it in the MRI. No, so no. we need to build a new model for MRI. And yeah, I choose MRI. Okay. Then I'm glad you did. <laughs> <laughs> Another question I have, but because we, 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 this is a very exciting field, right, for radiologists. Uh, some radiologists are afraid of it. Some people are really embracing it. But it's now going on for several years. But if you look at my day-to-day -day job, I don't, I don't see it almost everywhere, never. So, so how should we, as radiologists, like? If you would be a uh, head of the Department of Radiolo Radiology, what would you do to further implement these radionomics into really the work floor? And is it even possible? Because there are also some disadvantages of yeah. radionomics. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this is also a really good question. Uh, I mean, radiomics is a start around 2012, and we are 2022, and it, it has been a lot happen, but not in a clinical uh, practice. So my suggestion is here that if you want to really implement into the clinical pra practice, it needs to be multi-center study. It needs to be uh, valid externally validation of the model we built. Then we go for the uh, prospectively observatory of the model. Yeah. Then we can nicely shift it to the clinic. If we have a reproducible and a stable uh, features, and I, and I think that, uh, yeah, after the 10 years, 12 years after radiomics, now it's been the more guideline uh, coming off that if you want to put it into practice, what do you need to do? I mean, I think there was a lot of a study there, but it, but it was not really following up of the, all these limitation of the radiomics. And now we are aware of this is the limitation, how we can solve it. And I think we need more time to solve the, these challenges. And then we are ready uh, to do it in the clinical practice as a prospectively uh, observatory, not really into the practice now. Yeah. So how long do you think it will take? When does my job really change? It would I'm change. going in pension like 25 years or something. So is it before or after my pension? <laughs> it dep OK. Uh, six, OK. You have, to, I think, 20 more to go, right? Yeah, yeah. OK, so 10 Looking years. Looking forward to <laughs> it, by the way, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK, let's just say it in the next 10 years, maybe. Okay. Yeah. OK. Thank you for your, uh, for your answers. And uh, <laughs> I will you. give the word back to the Mr. Prorector. Thank you, Dr. Lahey. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Schoon. He's a gastroenterologist at Katharina Hospital Eindhoven and a professor in the same field at this university. Professor Schoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector. Uh, Mrs. Candidate, uh, just as my previous opponents, I would like to congratulate you with this scientific dissertation on this very interesting field, of course. And within these congratulations, I would like to involve your team of promoters and co-promoters as well. So as we heard here, artificial intelligence in image analysis is very interesting and relatively new, uh, but need to be uh, further uh, established in clinical practice. Uh, you created one of the building blocks, which is uh, in this excellent work. And I would like to take the opportunity to discuss with you chapter four. And in this chapter, you describe that CTA 
radiomics models are unable to project a new liver metastasis after a successful thermal ablation of colorectal liver metastasis. And um, so this is in fact an active study, which is always a dis little bit disappointing for the researchers, but very important to publish, as uh, these negative uh, results are unreported, as you mentioned. But probably there are some things to learn from it as well, and we have to look at that especially. My first question is, uh, as a clinician, I'm always interested in why, why would you like to predict recurrence in these patients? I know you're a technician, but you've discussed about that. What's the clinical relevance to find it early? Highly esteemed opponents, thank you very much for your kind word and the qu very good question. So in chapter four, we have the data set that uh, mm, it is the pre-ablation CT scan, and they are going to have the ablation. Uh, and we want to see if, if they develop new metastases later on in somewhere in the liver. So if we knew it in advance, maybe uh, we would go for the uh, different treatment strategy because we, we ablate those, li of those liver, but in, in, in some few months, it's going to have another metastasis somewhere else. So maybe if we knew it in advance, we would change the whole uh, treatment planning. So you would go to a more systemic treatment, for instance, or? Um... Yeah, probably, but it's not maybe based the patient really uh, favor uh, because it has a lot of side effect. Uh, mm. But but it's the it's the it's the information that the at least the doctors have that they can distort based on a patient age or the the, the healthy um, functioning that they can distort which way to go. Okay, could this, uh, this could change the surveillance and, and clinical follow-up? Yes. Uh, they can have a more intensive follow-up, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah true, one. true. So our follow-up could be better, uh, cheaper and individualized. That might be reasons to do that. And uh, in this uh, page 81, in this chapter, you describe that radiomics could detect microstructural changes due to visually uh, occult metastasis. And, and thereby you, you predicted in the previous uh, uh, chapter described the metachronous colorectal mm -hmm. liver metastasis. And you have three models, the, clin the radiomics model, clinical model, and combined models. But not in this chapter, and none of these models were good enough. And can you explain me what the possible reasons were? Why was this unsuccessful? And if you would repeat this experiment, what would you change? Um. That's, that's a really good question um, because we think that uh, as long as the liver has a metastasis, maybe it might affect the texture of the liver. So in both patients, now we are checking the healthy liver parenchyma, apparently healthy liver parenchyma, uh, but they are both affected by the, the liver metastasis. So the, the, I, the first hypothesis is that maybe uh, they, are, they have the same texture for now, because it's already affected. And we mentioned that in one of the study, uh, they investigated in the radiomix features of the, the patient that they don't have a liver metastasis, and they have a synchronous liver metastasis. And they extract the features of the radiomix of the features of the liver. And they could see the differences between that. So one of the hypotheses could be that, but it needs to be validated. Like we suggested, in a, just we can check it in a, uh, with MRI, for example, that we could see the uh, the liver metastasis. So uh, with the MRI, you should prove that this is a histological change yeah. and, uh, and, and not an epiphenomenon, uh, as you describe. Okay, I understand that. Um, since no accurate um, machine learning model could be developed, it would hypothesize that uh, the presence of uh, colorectal uh, liver metastasis affect the liver texture. So texture could, could be measured. Um, should be possible to define and measure this specific textural changes. But the changes between the, this liver and the healthy liver. Yes. But these two patients, they, they both have an affected texture. So that's why in, we could not distinguish between group A and group B in this study. OK. Um, I, I go over to another, thank you for your answer, I go over to another uh, chapter, and that's chapter 7, page 133. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a chapter on the prediction of local tumor progression after thermal ablation for colorectal liver metastasis. 
based on the pre-post uh, ablation of the CT scan. And uh, you conclude in page 104, our study demonstrates that transfer learning based deep features may be able to generate prognostic, prognostic imaging signatures for long term prediction of colorectal metastasis patients based on pre post ablation CT imaging. So, in this chapter, um, you use an algorithm based on the ResNet, uh, different ResNet uh, types, which have been trained with, uh, with Im ImageNet. And um, in this case, um, so um, why don't you create your radio net as radiologists? I mean, um, if you more specifically train with radiological images and you have thousands and billions of that in the world, uh, you, could, you could make a much more accurate algorithm probably. What's your opinion about that? I totally agree, because uh, at that time we built this model and we started using the transfer learning. The, the RAD ImageNet was not publicly available, and it's the, 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 the paper published around June, July 2022, I think. So now they have the really nice pu publicly available of their labeled radiological images. Okay. So f if I want to redo it this again, I would definitely go for the uh, RAD ImageNet. Okay, and um, so you do the transfer learning here, and in in in, in fact, because of you have yes, uh, 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 not too much data, you do a threefold cross validation, and uh, you you can uh, do cross validations many times more, but um, uh, why don't you do that? And can you explain maybe the reason for? Why a specific? We choose yeah. three. Yeah. Uh, because because it, it is around seventy nine patients. So if you do, for example, five, then you you end up with in each fold you end up with the less amount of the data for the training and testing. So is it, it was logical to do it in a three fold cross validation. Okay, and um, maybe you can explain the term overfitting for in the cross validations. Uh, based on the result, for example, in table is provided. Uh, yeah, we check the, uh, the 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 training AUC of the of the training of cross validation, and then and then the uh, the test set of it. Um, and yeah, if uh, and we, we did, did, there is a way that we could see that the model can overfit or not based on a this cohort or within a this this cohort we have. Yeah. And, and what's what's the problem uh, if you if you overfit and you go to uh, to external validation with this? If we do overfit, it wouldn't work. I, it wouldn't work in another another cohort. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, because you uh, you're very well in your own data set, but not in the, in no, the other ones. No, no, I can't. No. Yeah. Okay. No, well, thank you very much for your answers. So I'll give the word back to the provector. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Schoen. The opposition will now be continued and maybe also ended by Dr. Nikki Peters. She is a radiologist at the University Medical Center in town. Dr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear Thank candidates, you. I also would like to congratulate you on this very relevant work and also include your promotion team in the congratulations. Uh, personally, I cannot wait until we can start using your techniques into clinical practice. So first, I have two very short practical questions. Uh, firstly, the analysis you did in chapter three to mm -hmm. uh, analyze the texture of the liver, how much time would it take? And secondly, what would the cost be? Mm, esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. And if, if for to, to answer this to that question, we need to we need we need to take go through the radiomics step, so the image accusation part, but it's already retrospectively, so it was already done with the with the patient, and then the the, the really time consuming one is the segmentation. Uh, so if I want to take into account the manual one, it, it can take forever. <laughs> if, it, if you do it in a, a, a automatically segmentation one, it can, it can be really fast because already the model already developed, for example, for uh, um, uh, segmentation of the liver. Then it would be really fast, just adopt it, fine tune it for, for origin of the interest. Then the, when the, the, then the feature extraction part and then make the model work, it can take time, but if you have, if the, if you are confident about the model that the features are reproducible, that we externally validate that, and we are said that this is the model, mm -hmm. when we want to test it, it it it, it does it uh, it wouldn't take that much time. Okay. Uh, if I want to be more specifically, 
maybe i don't know five minutes okay so i was i was more thinking like it would take all night so if the patient is scanned you just put the data in the model and then the next day you could have the results yeah yeah okay and do you have any idea about the costs if you already have the the, the programs the software the, the the cost for the software no if you ha already have the software are there any additional costs that would hinder or implementing it into clinical practice so the software is the, the model, for example, we have, and then you want to put it in a clinical practice. So I think it would be the cost for um, centralization or localization of the software into the clinical workflow. Uh, and then I think it's the policy of the hospital and it ch can change between the different hospitals. Okay. So yeah. you don't foresee any uh, problems implementing it cost-wise? No, no. Okay, perfect. Um, then I would like to... Um, talk about your variables, you um, um, compared the different baseline characteristics between your training set and your validation set, mm -hmm. and you also took into account the different types of ablations, for instance, how many RFAs and how many MWAs uh, mm -hmm. have been performed, but the time period you've studied is quite long, so you started in 2008 and I think ended in 2018. Yeah. Uh, and we all know that um, when we start using techniques, they always get better and better and better over time. But I did not see you take that into account. So did you think about um, maybe also including the variable early ablation versus more recent ablation? And could you please elaborate on that? Yeah, sure. That's a really good uh, question. And we already make it in our limitation. And yeah, it was. I mean, uh, we didn't have that much detailed information from the 10 years ago, what exactly the brand or what exactly they did ablation. So the only variable we could take, t we took take care in the clinical model, it was that it was done with the RFA or it was done in the, with the microwave ablation. Um, and for, and, and if, you, if you want to uh, analyze it prospectively, uh, we need to take care to well document it that, okay, this is, the, this is the device, this is the how we set up for the ablation uh, for the future study. And I agree, yeah, it can affect. Okay, but did you see uh, when you think back about your analysis that the, more, uh, the most local tumor progressions were in the earlier ablations or did you not see any trend like that? We didn't check that, no. Okay, okay. that's fine, thank you. Um, and next, I was going to ask, um, hey, in your conclusions of almost every chapter of your thesis, you state that further research is necessary in a larger patient group and in a multidisciplinary setting. But I think that has, topic has been discussed uh, quite elaborately now. So I'm changing my question a little bit. Um, right now, I do a lot of MDTs with, in uh, cancer patients. And now we have the clinical data of the patient. We have the laboratory findings. We have the imaging findings and the pathology. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, let's say that everything has been tested extensively and your model is ready for clinics. How would you think, um, what would you think would be a good method to present your data? Because it can be quite uh, complicated, especially for yeah, normal clinicians, let's put it that, like that. Do you see it as an overlay or as a number or how should I visualize it? Uh, yeah, I'm I, I kind of big fan of, fan of the visualization, so it wouldn't be really in a chart or with a table, for example, we presented. I would go, for example, with the uh, with some nice visualization that okay, based on this model, you have the this uh, this result, and based on that 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 model, you have this result, and then at the end, you conclude that uh, this is the final decision making we have. Okay. That sounds already very simplified from uh, the, the, the work you have done. But for clinicians, they want to know black or white, uh, cancer or no cancer. Can it also be more um, constrained, for instance, that there's an overlay that every, everything that's good is, uh, for instance, yellow and everything that's bad, that's red, something like that? You say you would like to present it visually? Mm, you know yeah, I mean? the coloring would be option or ordering based on the, the prediction. Ordering would be also nice visualization uh, that we can have. Yeah. Okay, so it can be yeah. simplified yeah, in yeah. order yeah. to. But work I, into I wouldn't frame. go for the yellow. For, I mean, I wouldn't go for the zero and one because it's. I mean, it should be gray in between. Yeah. I mean, we cannot make the decision. This is this is what we're gonna do. As a radiologist, I totally agree. <laughs> it should be gray. Yeah. Okay, then we move on to let's see. Yeah, I would like to talk to you as well about the clinical model that you use in chapter three. Uh, you did everything to optimize the radiomics model, but the clinical model is quite, yeah, not so elaborate. And... Um, Bora asks... 
So the question has not yet been put forward, so there is no reason to answer it. <laughs> and <laughs> that means that, we, uh, that the opportunity for the defense of your thesis is over now. The committee will withdraw for deliberation, and I request you and your company to remain in this hall and await your return. Thank you. Thank you all. The PhD defense has now ended. The degree committee will debate the candidate's performance behind closed doors. This process usually takes about 10 minutes. is tied long road i don't waste no time break rules because fate decides with the team and we chase the light i make a move fall down shake it off i hate to lose that branch break it off no room for negativity praise and love prepare for deep park because we're taking off Hit the
niet nog een keer doen. Moet ik er vast zetten? Ja, dat staat mooi. Dear candidate, the committee has discussed the quality of your thesis and the way you dis, uh, defended it. Uh, based on a positive verdict on both aspects and in view of the examinations, your former examinations, it has decided to confer upon you the title of doctor. Professor Chan, no, not Professor Chan, sorry, <laughs> Professor Bates Tan is uh, authorized to confer upon you this uh, academic distinction. The floor is to your promoter. Thank you. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Marciane Tagafi, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. And as evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Beautiful. Congratulations. Thank you. So congratulations, Dr. Tagavi. Uh, I would like to give the honor to Dr. Maas, your co-promoter, to give you the laudatio. Thank you. So, Majane, doctor, there we go. Tagavi Razavizadeh. <laughs> well done. <laughs> it's a great honor to be able to honor you with your wonderful thesis and defense. I was a bit anxious, you know, because I had no way of escaping to say your last name in full for the first time, I think. I so I hope it was all right. <laughs> first of all, I'd like to congratulate you with gaining your academic degree. You did great. I would also like to congratulate Sorab, who stood by your side the whole time. <laughs> and also my congratulations to your father and sisters. Uh, I think your father and one sister is joining us online. My congratulations. I hope you could follow it well through the internet. They must be very proud, mm -hmm. and I really, really think your mother would have been so proud to see yeah. you. I'm so sorry she's not here, she's not with us, and um, it would have been a wonderful day, but it still is a wonderful day because you did it. It's such a good moment and a good day for you. Well, just to go a little bit back in time, I think not everyone knows that I did not start off as a co-promoter for March Day from the early beginning. I think you were working for about one year at the NKI, and you were working hours and hours and hours and hours and weekends, and you were struggling to finish that one project you were working on. <laughs> yeah. Then I can remember, because I, I spoke to you about it a couple of times, and then Professor Bietstaan and Professor van der Heide asked me to join you, or yeah. asked you to join my team yeah, to yeah. work on some projects on liver metastasis. <laughs> um, with that, I was seven months pregnant, so I was a bit in doubt whether I would be able to support you enough. But in the end, we really did it together with the other members of the promotion team. And we even had two babies and one PhD <laughs> thesis. <laughs> yes, I had two pregnancies during her PhD time, so it's even uh, better that she finished this all in this short amount of time. Um, 
In the beginning, we had some uh, different language and different backgrounds, of course, so we sometimes had some funny issues. For example, when we went to the evaluation committee at one year, uh, <laughs> she had to write a report for me and for the committee, and then she stapled it, but she stapled it in the upper right corner. So I was like, huh, what's this? So she did it in the Arabic way, and I had to um, <laughs> look to it from the right to, or the back to the front. Also, when you started working with me, I asked you, where do you live? And you said, pet hoofed up. I was like, pet hoofed up? Yes, pet hoofed up. I was, oh, you mean bat hoofed up? Yes, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so work-wise, there were also some language issues in the beginning because the clinical language was something we really had to get to know together, I think. And I think you did it so well. Today, we could really see that <laughs> you really mastered this clinical language. You mastered the clinical background. So you did great in learning this throughout the years with a little bit of help well, Femke, so I know you went to her every time I explained things twice, you just went to her, because apparently she was better at that. At the time now, there were, that is where our offices are. She was located in the geek room, together with PhD bestie Paula. She was the, it was the room with the nicest scenery. I heard rabbits passed by, beautiful fields with green were shown outside. Even husbands tended to show up with roses on Valentine's Day in front of her window. I never had that. <laughs> Apparently, you did need some more um, silent surroundings for your focus. And uh, you had a lot of noise around you and a moving screen because of your colleague Niels. So you might wonder why did the screen move so much with Niels? Well, our, our building, the Thai House, is actually a temporary construction. So uh, when anyone passes by or just moves, <laughs> everything moves in our rooms. We have the same problem, Max and I. Um, <laughs> so you actually tried another room, I heard, but you were like back in one day because you couldn't really miss your geek room buddies. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> uh, the next page, it's stuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there we go. So you are a very socially active person. You were always in for something nice, a chat, a lunch of coffee or coffee. You always joined me to the coffee machine. And you had regular Iran-inspired lunches with your Iranian colleagues. You also took part in sports, loved to dance, and you hang out a lot with Stefano, your townhouse buddies, Paula, Teresa, and Yeva. <coughs> I also really enjoyed your company during all the years. We had great talks about research, about life, also about your family and Sorab. You were always very love, uh, full of love about your family and your friends. And I hope after this corona period, you will be able to see them much more often than you could before. Marjane, you are one of the warmest people I've met and it was a true pleasure to work with you. I'm so proud of you and you have also achieved to get the Dutch citizenship this year, so this is like the best year ever, I think. I wish you all the best and enjoy the rest of the day with your family, friends and colleagues and us. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. On this side now, Dr. Tagavi, my congratulations with the uh, doctor's title. Uh, also, congratulations to your family and other loved ones. Um, yeah, it is uh, a pleasure for us to have a non-university Maastricht alumnus having her finalizing her academic career today here in, at our university. We we'll thank you for that, to attach your name to our university <laughs> forever. Um, it gives us a lot of pleasure and also some revenues. <laughs> which I may not always mention, but that is also true. Thank you. Um, and I thank uh, also the, our guests from other universities, that is to say Professor Nissen and Dr. Lahey. The others have their gowns in our colors and they are yeah, part of the, of the, of the whole uh, team and need no further thanks. They have to do that as their job. But we are thankful for Dr. Professor Nissen Alahe <laughs> to be with us today <laughs> as guests from other universities. I thank you also already for the reception you're giving us, offering us, <laughs> and the reception will take place in the refectory of this former uh, monks uh, uh, convention. We are sitting here in a former church. 
you are standing on the altar, but it is already all <laughs> very long ago. And um, yeah, we have some, some photo sessions still here before I close the meeting. You don't have to wait for that. Uh, you just go already to the reception room, take a glass of uh, drinks and whatever that may be presented to you. And we have a photo session. Then we have a photo session with our professor Nissen because he is then faded away by our technicians and he can start his work again in Rotterdam. We make a picture on the staircase mm -hmm. in the hall for your future uh, working room or office or whatever you have <laughs> in your future. I wish you all success in your academic career and this title will help you already a bit. And uh, I close this academic session now. Thank you. <clears throat>